it seems like it would require a tremendous amount of leadership ability to even try to remain as, as emperor, maintain some sort of uh, peace. And I'm curious to ask something that's fascinating to me. Stoicism, most people are familiar with maybe often called the dichotomy of control. You know, what's up to us? What's not up to us? But then leadership, many people define leadership something along the lines of influencing others. And I'm sure that was part of of that art of leadership that Marcus Aurelius was putting into practice of this influencing others. Yeah, but the dichotomy of control is about realizing that we don't have complete control over external events, despite the fact that we can obviously influence them i mean if anyone thinks it means that we have no influence over any external that, that would be crazy like so then i guess you'd yeah. be tough to live like a jellyfish or something you know like you shouldn't do anything right but of course the stoics believe that we can influence external events here's a clue they wrote books and gave lectures right <laughs> yeah. so you, you compare it to that what would be the point in epictetus telling us this if he didn't believe that telling us about the dichotomy of control might mean that we could learn from his words and he'd have some influence <laughs> over us, right? So teachers yeah. are leaders, in a sense. It's a different type of leadership, but all, all the Stoic scholars and teachers are leaders, in a sense. They're, they're kind of thought leaders. They're, they're educators, um, even if they're not political leaders. So I think a bad leader also would be somebody... I mean, a crazy leader would be somebody who believes that he has complete control over the people that work for him or the people that serve under him. Um, so the truth is obviously somewhere in between. Like, we only have absolute control over our own, by definition, voluntary thoughts and actions. We don't even have complete control over all of our actions. Some of them are involuntary. We don't even... Mm. We certainly don't. Any There are... I mean, some of the things that people say about stoicism are so kind of dumb that you know these things on the internet where you're like you know the meme that says not sure if you're trolling or just stupid but there's things that people say about stoicism that are so weird it, it sounds hard to refute them because it, it sounds patronizing like so there are people who criticize stoicism in writing in articles even because they think that the stoics believe that we have control over all of our thoughts right the stoics just have to be insane to believe that like you know, because it's obviously self-evidently not true, right? But you'll you'll read people on the internet who interpret stoicism that way, like it's kind of a straw man argument because they're attributing a view to the Stoics that's so obviously ridiculous that it's really easy to refute. Of course, we don't have complete voluntary control over everything that goes on between our ears, like you know, and and the, the Stoics clearly don't believe that. So the Stoics think that we have voluntary control over some of our thoughts and some of our actions. And a lot of what goes on inside us, emotionally and cognitively, is automatic or involuntary. And a, a lot of what's going on in our environment is, is just simply, you know, out of our hands. Um, and a good leader is grounded or centred on his own voluntary thoughts and actions and has to make many judgment calls about probability. Like, you know, but the Stoics thought we need to keep a focus on our locus of control. The the modern author who says something very similar to that, I mean, there are many modern authors who say things that are similar, but the one that strikes me most is Stephen Covey, who has essentially exactly the same idea in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, he talks about the sphere of control or something, I think he's, I haven't read it for a while, but I think, I think that's how he phrases it. And so it's a simple idea, um, but it's really about mindfulness in a way and about taking ownership and responsibility. Now, just as an aside, in the field of psychotherapy, so by profession, I'm a cognitive behavioral psychotherapist. Um, I would go as far as to say, and I, I specialized in treating anxiety disorders. Like I, I would go as far as to say that the dichotomy of control is possibly the most fundamental concept um, in my eyes, in the treatment of anxiety and depressive disorders in general, like maybe, like it's certainly one of the most fundamental 
ideas. I could I could wax lyrical at great length about the many ways in which people who suffer from anxiety disorders tend to get confused about what aspects of their experience are under direct control and which aspects aren't. Like blurring that distinction is definitely fundamental to psychopathology in the anxiety disorders and I think in depression as well. So it's the Stoics were definitely way ahead of their time in that regard. And, and it's a confusing idea. And I think modern uh, Stoics, uh, modern students of Stoicism, would, would definitely benefit from exploring that idea in a much deeper and a much more nuanced way because there's a great deal to be gained from it. Um, I'll give it very briefly. Like, um, typically in, in anxiety disorders, with any client I would, I'd be working with, one of the first things I would do would be to say, look, there are involuntary, physiological largely, uh, also cognitive, aspects of anxiety that are what we call automatic in modern cognitive psychology. So there are thoughts that just pop in your mind, um, there are flashbacks and memories, there are physiological symptoms of anxiety, like your, your hands sweating, your heart beating and stuff like that, that are largely involuntary or certainly not under direct voluntary control. And most people make those symptoms worse by trying to control them, whereas they'd be mm. better off to view them with indifference and accept them as natural like, and in, in, in the harmless and indifferent. And we, so we know that there's tons of research that point in that direction. So they, what they need to do is to learn to be more indifferent, more accepting towards all these different involuntary aspects of anxiety. And at the same time, most people, and there's direct research that directly shows that most people with certain types of anxiety will underestimate how much voluntary control they have over certain types of thinking, such as rumination and worry, or how we tend to describe it. So how much time they spend ruminating about the things that are making them anxious is under voluntary control, actually. But clients and therapists say, no, it's, un it's out of my control. I can't control how much I worry. But we know that they can. They, they, so they are, they're, in some areas, they overestimate the control like, and overextend it. In other areas, they're underestimating the control. So that's how, like, literally how mixed up people are about what's going on inside their own head. And sorting that out is absolutely, of course, when you describe it like that, it's clear that's going to be fundamental to, to doing any type of cognitive therapy. It's so fascinating what you say there. And I mean, that whole bit could maybe be under an umbrella of like understanding human nature. I was just, as I said, cracking open the graphic novel novel in the idea of um, it, it was on the page of the dialogue of Socrates saying that no one essentially knowingly does wrong. It seems, and, and I'm someone who's read a lot of leadership books. I mean, it was formerly a big leadership nerd. I mean, there are lots of leadership books where you can pick it up and there's really not a chapter on that type of understanding human nature and some of those aspects of, of, of being human. That might be the, co the most controversial philosophical idea in history. Like mm. that, that's it was famously Socrates that said that. I stood up and said that in the Marine Corps University, like, and the people kind of gasped. Like, but I was very careful. I said, like, I said, well, let's kind of like unpack this idea, right? No man does evil <laughs> willingly or knowingly. Like, both he says, both like Socrates says, and the Stoics were all in, like, with that idea. Um, I think it's incredibly important, like, because. You know, the way I would frame it, there's many ways that we can try and unpack that idea. But one is, like, if you take any horrible dictator in history, like Stalin or, you know, Hitler or whoever, they totally believed that what they were doing was justified. Like, they were, they didn't, Hitler didn't wake up cackling in the morning and think, I'm just going to do something really evil for the sake of it. Like, he completely believed in his crazy ideology. And, like, he absolutely believed that he was doing the right thing and it was justified. That's why he was so dangerous. Like, you know, the, the, the most dangerous people are the ones that believe that what they're doing is rational and justified, right? Um, I mean, in a way, if you didn't, if you thought what you were doing was just evil and crazy, you'd probably be more hesitant about it. 
Like, and it would be less infectious. Like, the dangerous dictators believe that, or the ones that believe they're justified, because then they spread that to everybody else as well. They start going around trying to convince other people to, to believe them. They've got a crazy rationale for what they're doing. But if you think about it that way, then you would view wrongdoing more as ignorance or as people being misguided or making errors of judgment rather than just kind of crude, malicious intention. And, I mean, at the very least, then you kind of think, I need to try and understand these guys more. And in order to deal with them, of course, I'm going to need to know more about their thinking.